the things that you have to do, works that you have to do within the church or uh, even without the church in order to get saved, okay? In order, their way to get saved. It's all about works, in other words. C.S. Lewis was a sacramentalist and an Anglican who really did not want to pursue the ecclesiastical question further than he did. Lewis himself and I... Lewis himself, and I probably can find you the quote in one of his letters, I think it's in the letters to Malcolm, Lewis speaks of having been at an orthodox liturgy, and he said he loved it. He said some stood, some sat, some knelt, and one old man crawled around on the floor like a caterpillar. He absolutely loved it. End of quote. Sounds like a lot of your charismatic services. I sat on a thing the other day on this on this uh, lady in the uh, Pentecostal church, and uh, this lady pastor who looks like she had a crew cut. Um, probably could be a drill sergeant, maybe. And uh, she probably thinks she is a drill sergeant in the army of God. Anyway, sorry. Um, but she's in there, and she has this lady, this prophetess in there. And the lady is prophesying. Prophesying. And the whole time she's prophesying, her head is, is whipping back and forth. Like... Like, just whipping. Like a bobblehead. The whole time. This goes on for several minutes. And it's just an example of, of all the unbiblical things that go on in, in churches, particularly charismatic circles. The Bible says that, that everything should be done in decency and in order. Okay? And, and for women not to take this type of preeminent position in a church, where they're in there... I mean, I'm sorry, but she was, she was a, a, basically acting like an idiot. You know, demon possessed, really, and yet she is the one they're all looking to to get their spiritual guidance from. Even though most of what's coming out of their mouths is totally against the Bible, it doesn't matter because they believe it's this new revelation from God. What a joke! Uh, a sick joke. So if we go back to this article, Lewis's good, very close friend J. R. R. Tolkien, the man who wrote the Hobbit books and was a very devout Roman Catholic. You know, that's funny. When I was young, this is way before, I, was, I wasn't saved, I had a girlfriend in high school, and her dad really liked me, and he gave me the Hobbit books, the Lord of the Rings, he says, you got to read these. Now, he was a devout Catholic. I don't know, maybe that was his subtle way of trying to maybe witness to me, in a way. Because that was the only thing the man ever really, really emphasized that I need to read. And this is how people in, in other religions will try to lure you in to certain things. But yeah, J.R. Tolkien, he wrote the Hobbit books, Lord of the Rings, was a very devout Roman Catholic, tried hard over the years to budge Lewis across the line. He got nowhere. Oh yeah, because Lewis was so... just such a, you know, stalwart defender of the faith. Lewis would not speak about church questions. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but like when we go out to eat and stuff, like after we do this, that's all we talk about is the Lord and, and, and the Bible and stuff. I mean, I'm not going to say it's all we talk about, but it does tend to dominate our conversations. Not because we're trying to act religious, just because it's within us. We want to do that. But a guy like this, and so much of the time, pastors... You get them off on their own. They don't want nothing to do. They don't want. They don't want to talk about the Bible. They don't want to talk about Christianity. Why? If the Holy Spirit lives inside you, shouldn't that be something you want? Especially if you've, let's say, for the week been kind of isolated, because it's kind of hard to find Christians anymore to really fellowship. Most of the people I've ever been around don't want to talk about the Lord. Okay, we heard enough about that in church. Bless God, we don't need to be talking about it all the time. We need to go to all-you-can-eat to buffets afterward. Oh, they, that's real big in the Baptist circles. I've been there too. Not to say I'm against the Baptist tenets, okay? I'm saying a lot of what they do, just like a lot of denominations, is unbiblical. Yeah, bless God. We can't, we can't drink and we can't smoke, but we can go out we can eat a ton of food. We can be gluttonous. <laughs> I'm serious. That's pretty much how they look at it. But, um... Yeah, they don't want to talk about God. They don't want to talk about the Lord. They don't want to talk about the Bible. I'm sorry, when I'm with Christians, that is an inevitability for me. 
It just flat out is. Not to say I think I'm so much better. I'm just saying that, that if you're truly fellowshipping with somebody that's a Christian, that's just going to happen. But, and I guess it didn't for C.S. Lewis. He would not speak about church questions. He wouldn't do it. We only know for sure what C.S. Lewis loved. We only knew for sure that C.S. Lewis loved the Orthodox Church. Why? Because it made him feel religious. He was no different than any other pagan. Because essentially that's what they are. They're pagans. They can do it under the name of, of Jesus all they want. It doesn't make it so. It does not make it so. Go ahead. Now, Doug brought up a really good point. He's had more exposure to some of these things than I've ever had. And um, that's what's really cool about this little group that we have, because we've each got our own little niche and exposures thing where we can kind of help others and um, add to um, maybe an a overall experience about a certain thing. And with the liturgies, when you, when you come away from them, and these, these, particularly if you think about it, if you're going to some in ornate church, like some big multi-million dollar Catholic or Greek or whatever church you're going to, and you come away and, and these liturgies are these very, very well-written, well-scripted, you know, they're all dressed up and, and, you're re and you come away thinking, you know, that you're on this higher spiritual plane almost. And what is that if you look at it at its essence? It's arrogance, it's pride, is what it's actually instilling in the person. This is why it's so hard, one of the reasons it's so hard for them to break away. Because, they've, if, especially if you've been brought up in this, you think, well, I'm, I'm better, this is good, this is religious. And you come away with this sense of pride, and pride blinds you. Pride, if you let it exist in your, in your body, your soul and spirit, it will blind you to the truth. And you will have a very, very hard time breaking free from it. Particularly the longer you stay in it. Because it's a demon. It's, it's a spiritual influence over you. And if you let it stay, it gets, hooked, it gets its hooks into you further and further. The more years you stay into it, the harder it is to get out. So, that's what C.S. Lewis loved. He loved the Orthodox Church. But he didn't join it. He remained in the Anglican. So at least we know he was good there. No, just kidding. Speaking, then another question. Speaking as a layman, it seems to me that the theology you get out of the Chronicles of Narnia, the Great Divorce, the Screwtape Letters, is orthodox. I was recently rereading the Screwtape Letters, and C.S. Lewis has a section where the Screwtape lead demon is writing to another little demon called Wormwood. And says something like this. In misleading your Protestant convert, the best thing to do is to get him to pray extemporaneously. Make sure that the above, that above all, he does not pray the liturgical prayers his mother might have taught him. Let him think that everything he says is original. Let's talk about that a little bit. So what he's saying in the book is that the demon is, is supposedly saying to this other demon, whatever you do, don't let him pray the liturgical prayers because they're the prayers that are really powerful. Don't get him to pray extemporaneously like praying like out of your heart. I mean, wouldn't that be? You, you're, you're praying to God. You're not praying some scripted, rote prayer. Okay? You're praying to God as a born-again Christian but they're saying, oh, that, that's what they, supposedly, that's what the demons want us to do. They want us to, well, God forbid, don't let them pray those liturgical prayers, because evidently, that's what shakes hell. Give me a break, it's the exact opposite. That's why he put it in there. He's trying, this guy is good at what he does, man. And it's not C.S. Lewis. Let's boil this back again. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against princes, principalities, and rulers of wickedness in high places. So what we're battling and what we're seeing in C.S. Lewis's writings isn't C.S. Lewis so much. It's the demons and the devils that are controlling and inspiring him to pen this to paper. That's what we're seeing, right? 
So I, I, I should have said that up front because we're kind of getting our, our eyes on the man when it really should be on the demons and devils that are influencing his writings. <laughs> that Oh man, isn't that subtle? That last quote? So in other words, the liturgical prayers are where it's at. I mean, but if this is a big secret that the devil doesn't want us to know. And it's exactly the exact opposite. Because remember, Satan is the father of lies. When I read C.S. Lewis, I hear an orthodox voice. I hear a sacramentalist and a liturgical traditionalist writing. How do evangelical, let alone fundamentalist Protestants, read C.S. Lewis and think that they are reading someone who is on their side? That's what this guy is asking this Catholic. Okay? He says, how are they, even this guy, is saying, how do evangelical, let alone fundamentalist Protestants, Read C.S. Lewis and think that they're reading someone's on their side. I would agree. How could they? Here is the answer from the Catholic, who, who studied C.S. Lewis his whole life, or most of his life. He says, maybe I'm being a little bit naughty. <laughs> Don't you love that part? Maybe I'm being a little bit naughty. But the answer is probably the same way they read the Bible. Apparently, it's possible to read the Bible as a Protestant for 60 or 70 years and to never see it. So, let's, let's clarify this point here. The question was really, how is to someone that's a Bible-believing Christian, let's just say that, how is that person to read C.S. Lewis and think that they're reading someone who's on their side? Well, this Catholic says, probably the same way they read the Bible. Apparently, it's possible to read the Bible as a Protestant for 60 or 70 years and never see it. And that's very, very true. Most people that are in churches for year after year after year, they're in these dead denominations, and they're not even saved. They, they might have been reading the Bible for 60, 70 years, and they don't see it either. By the same token, C.S. Lewis... C.S. Lewis's evangelical American, quote, clientele simply don't get it. This is what this Catholic is saying. Lewis's clientele. If you're a follower of Lewis, he refers to you as his clientele. Why? How did he make money? By selling his books? His writings, right? Well, isn't the love of money the root of all evil? If you have a clientele, that implies that they're, they're your client. They're coming to you for a service, and you're providing them a service, and you're making money. I think it's a very accurate statement. C.S. Lewis had a lot to gain by winning over evangelicals for the money, but he also could corrupt them through his perverted writings. So subtle. When C.S. Lewis speaks of the blessed sacrament, they don't hear it. This is what this Catholic is saying. He's right. When Lewis speaks of the prayers of the church, the liturgies, they don't hear it. When Lewis speaks of auricular confession, meaning in the ear, meaning when you say it to a priest, which is totally unbiblical, when Lewis speaks of auricular confession in his own writings, which he practiced, they don't hear it. C.S. Lewis would have been very, very ill at ease with his eager North American free church clientele. In other words, C.S. Lewis would have not been comfortable in the average church that would absolutely elevate this man on a total pedestal and almost worship him like a god. He wouldn't even be comfortable in their churches. Because, let's say they're not doing the liturgy, they're not doing the sacraments, they're not doing auricular confession, they don't believe in purgatory, they don't believe in prayers for the dead. We haven't even gotten into a couple of these things yet, but we're going to see that later. And here's a Catholic that sees it a hundred times better than the average Christian that follows C.S. Lewis. All of this stuff is in his writings. We've already quoted a whole bunch of it. Yet, most people refuse to see it, hear it, or believe it. Again, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So I'm going to stop there. We're going to go to part two next.